I'm Dr. Larry Boxer, and I'm currently a professor of pediatric hematology oncology at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And I've been there since 1982. And I think one of your other questions has to do, when did I become interested in neutropenia? Well, it goes back a long way. After completing my residency in pediatrics at Stanford University, where I went to medical school, I was drafted into the military during the Vietnam period. At that time, there was a doctor draft. And uh, I was very fortunate to be assigned to Tripler Hospital in Honolulu, Hawaii. And I set up the hematology clinic turned out a little baby, a two-week-old, was brought to me, and uh, this child had a generalized skin infection and neutropenia. And I started to evaluate the cause of the neutropenia, and uh, eventually, working with the Japanese immunologist in Honolulu, we ended up describing a case of transplacental passage of an antibody from the mother to the infant that destroyed the infant's neutrophils. And shortly thereafter, a Navy captain's 10-year-old daughter was brought to me, and we ended up making a diagnosis of autoimmune neutropenia. And those two cases really engendered my interest in uh, mechanisms and treatment underlying neutropenia, and I've been involved ever since. And that goes back to the early 1970s. It turned out even before uh, growth factors such as Neupogen or GCSF became available, were even discovered, uh, there were some rare patients who had congenital forms of neutropenia. And those who lived long enough, there were a few described in the medical literature that developed uh, leukemia. Subsequently, since we've had Neupogen available and uh, we've been treating patients now since the uh, mid-1980s, we've realized there are only selective groups of patients that are at risk for developing leukemia. A few forms of congenital neutropenia those associated with the mutation of a granule of a protein found in neutrophils called elastase that I'm sure my colleague Dr. Dale spoke about, and um, some other rare forms of uh, neutropenia, but it is not a problem seen with patients with cyclic neutropenia or idiopathic neutropenia. And we have uh, now over 25 years worth of experience to make a firm issue there. So the risk with the, the use of the growth factor probably uh, several fold. One, fortunately, the growth factor allows patients to live longer in the past without Neupogen. Children with congenital neutropenia, the majority died in early infancy from serious lung infections, liver abscesses, blood infection. And uh, part of the risk then living longer, they become susceptible as a, uh, from a genetic point of view for leukemia. And Neupogen, probably if you start to form a uh, cancer cell, uh, facilitates the growth of the cancer cell, but per se, it doesn't cause leukemia by itself, as evidenced by the uh, fact that patients with cyclic neutropenia or idiopathic neutropenia who are chronically on Neupogen don't develop leukemia. So if it's warranted weighing risk versus benefit to prevent morbidity and mortality in children with congenital neutropenia, I would advise treating. What is the role for bone marrow transplantation in uh, the treatment uh, portfolio for neutropenia? And there are at least a couple of circumstances. One of them is pretty easy, 
if patients don't respond to conventional doses of GCSF, then uh, they should undergo a bone marrow transplant. And the results with bone marrow transplant under those circumstances have been phenomenally good. Certainly with a sibling that is a full house match compatible with the uh, youngster with neutropenia, we enjoy 100% success. And going outside of the family and finding an appropriate donor we uh, enjoy probably an 85 to 90 percent success in eradicating the neutropenia. The other uh, situation where um, we feel transplantation is beneficial, if a uh, patient begins to transform that, uh, from a uh, state in which they do not have leukemia, but are transforming into a situation where they have conventional uh, leukemia or another bone marrow disease called myelodysplasia, which is the abnormality in production not only of neutrophils, but other blood components as well. Those patients are candidates for bone marrow transplantation. Turns out that obviously the word idiopathic is a conventional term that we use in medicine. We don't understand what the cause is. And when we do, we get rid of idiopathic. Now, we suspect some causes of idiopathic may relate to autoimmunity. And um, certainly with some of the forms of leukemia, or not leukemia, excuse me, of neutropenia where over the past decade where we made great strides in molecular diagnosis, we've uh, identified causes of neutropenia from a genetic point of view. A majority of patients, however, that do not have congenital or cyclic neutropenia, um, we really don't know what the basis is. And so they remain idiopathic. But we have our eyes and ears open to try and elucidate a mechanism so that we can more appropriately treat them. There's one disorder that we commonly see in pediatrics that's called uh, benign neutropenia, uh, that with time, uh, the youngsters usually fully recover. In recent years, we've shown that many of these cases are due to uh, the presence of an antibody that reacts against the neutrophil and with time disappears. I think it's important for physicians to listen uh, to patients and parents in uh, terms of the management of neutropenia. It's been my experience often that uh, especially with patients with idiopathic neutropenia, that uh, often if they're uh, adults, they're uh, often treated with uh, very high doses, elevated doses of neupogen that cause bone pain. And uh, this becomes very troubling for the patient. And it's been my experience often we can do better by giving much lower doses more frequently. Another uh, situation in patients with cyclic neutropenia, doctors often think that by administering neupogen less frequently, say every other day or every third day, it, it will allow the patient to avoid shots. On the other hand, uh, it, that's really not an optimal treatment. We have no data to suggest that really helps the patient as well as just administering low doses daily. So there's an issue of listening to the patient and proper delivery and frequency of administrating Neupogen in many cases. In response to your question, what is the mechanism of the pain and how frequent should you give? the drug and at what amount should it be employed. Uh, sometimes the uh,
patients require elevated amounts and are particularly sensitive uh, to uh, getting pain, uh, even if they're getting the drug frequently. They're requiring uh, elevated amounts to stimulate the bone marrow, and it becomes problematic. Um, and uh, if the patient needs it, uh, I have two patients, as a matter of fact, that have a lot of bone pain and are having to get opioids, narcotics, to control that pain. We, uh, they're older patients and we haven't considered bone marrow transplantation, but we may just have to do that because their lives are miserable. Uh, more commonly, it's just not administered correctly. It's given to it frequently. And what happens, it's like uh, kicking the mule uh, to get it going. There's, you give it a good kick, uh, but it causes a lot of discomfort in the mule. And uh, with gentle prodding by daily administration, you can avoid that pain.